It's time now for the last word with Lawrence O'Donnell. Good evening, Lawrence. I think you got a big guest lined up. We do. Uh, we have the winner of the Democratic Senate primary in Ohio, and that, of course, is Senator Sherrod Brown. He's going to be joining us tonight on Ohio primary night. Andrew Weissman will be joining us uh, this evening with uh, more defendant Trump news, including this astonishingly uh, insane uh, appeal to the United States Supreme Court uh, that we're going to get yeah. to uh, during this hour. You have a great show, my friend. Thank you, Ellie. Thank you. Bye. Well, tonight, NBC News is projecting that once again, Joe Biden will win a much larger percentage of the vote in the Democratic presidential primary in Ohio than Donald Trump will win in the Republican presidential primary in Ohio. Joe Biden currently has 87 percent of the vote. Donald Trump currently has 79 percent of the vote. And NBC News projects that the Republican nominee for Senate in the state of Ohio will be the Trump-endorsed candidate Bernie Moreno. Bernie Moreno is running for the Senate seat held for the last 17 years by Senator Sherrod Brown, who won his primary tonight with 100 percent of the vote. Bernie Moreno got 49.7 percent of the vote in a primary against a more moderate Nikki Haley style candidate, Matt Dolan, who has 33 percent of the vote. If the Trump Republicans win the Senate seat in Ohio, then they will almost certainly take control of the United States Senate with a Republican majority leader and with Republican chairmen in every Senate committee. That would mean that President Biden would be unable to confirm a single federal judge in a Biden second term, or it would mean that Trump nominated judges would speed through the Senate into the federal courts where they would continue to specialize in taking rights away from Americans as the Trump judges have already done. The stakes could not be higher in the presidential campaign, and the stakes could not be higher in the Senate campaign in Ohio this year. Martin Sheen, whose acting career has included so many brilliant performances, beginning with films such as Badlands with Sissy Spacek and Apocalypse Now with Marlon Brando, and continuing into the 21st century in his television portrayal of a president of the United States in the NBC series, The West Wing. Martin Sheen was born in Dayton, Ohio, and was, at least once that I'm aware of, approached by the Democratic Party to run for office in Ohio. Martin Sheen was flattered, but he also believed that there were better people to serve in government, which is why he endorsed Sherrod Brown for Senate and recorded this ad for the Brown Senate campaign released today. The dignity of work is the idea that hard work should pay off for everyone, no matter who you are, where you live, or what kind of work you do. Whether you swipe a badge or punch a clock, whether you work for tips or earn a salary, whether you're caring for an aging parent or raising children, your work has dignity. This fight is about whose side you're on. I'll always be on the side of Ohioans. I've spent my entire career fighting for the dignity of work. I won't stop now. Join our campaign today. And joining us now is Democratic Senator Sherrod Brown of Ohio. He's the chair of the Senate Banking Committee and is running for re-election to the United States Senate. Uh, Senator, 100 percent of the vote sounds pretty good to me in the Democratic <laughs> Senate primary. Um, I'll take it. I Considering, it's, well, yeah, I mean, there weren't a lot of people running, but I think my, my career in terms of fighting for workers and taking on special interest is why nobody challenged me in the primary. But I didn't really expect to, st to talk about 100 percent of the vote. But thank you very much, Lawrence. So you, you have uh, a son of Ohio, Martin Sheen, uh, who does not easily step forward in these situations. Uh, tell us about how that ad came together with Martin Sheen. Yeah, we, we've, uh, Martin, and, Martin and I and Con Janet and Connie, and my wife, have known each other now for more than a decade. Martin, I love to tell the story. He's been in campaigning a half dozen times for me, and I love to tell the story. Martin Sheen's first job was he was a caddy at the Dayton Country Club, and he was fired for trying to organize a union. So 
that's who Martin Sheen is. <laughs> Dignity of work absolutely fits him. And he's fought the same kind of special interests we do and always devoted his life to justice. And one of my favorite moments campaigning is when Martin uh, spent se spent two days with us. The second day back in 2012, we ended up in John Glenn's apartment for a fundraiser. And all day Martin was talking about, I can't believe I'm going to get to see John Glenn and go to his apartment. And John Glenn had told me two days earlier, I can't believe Martin Sheen's <laughs> coming to my place. So um, two, two heroes, as far as I'm concerned, uh, in very different ways. Ways, but both of them just terrific human beings that fight for justice and fought for people who, who don't always get a break in life. You know, I didn't begin this segment tonight thinking I was going to learn a new biographical fact about Martin Sheen and his very right. first organizing experience uh, at the country club. That's a, that's a great one. Uh, so as you go forward in this campaign, it looks like you now you, you know who you're going to be running against. Uh, Bernie Moreno, what do Ohio voters need to know uh, so that they know what's at stake in this election between these two candidates for Senate? Well, they, they know that that um, Bernie Moreno always looks out for himself. I mean, he he is um, he has said in this campaign that he won't work with Democrats. Uh, he just is going to go to Washington and do his own thing. Uh, he's illustrated that by, again, calling for a national abortion ban uh, with no exceptions, even though Ohio overwhelmingly last November uh, voted by 13 points uh, for a, for a, uh, for constitutional amendment on abortion rights. And uh, the arrogance of he doesn't really care what the voters want. Um, that's really who he is. And we will make that contrast of I fight for Ohio. Um, I listen to people. I do roundtables all over the state. That's how we that's how we helped Senator Tester write the PACT Act. That's how we got a good infrastructure bill. That's how we got the CHIPS bill. It's going to create thousands of jobs in Ohio. That's how you do this job. You go county to county. You listen to people. You come back with ideas. You convince your colleagues to pass the child tax credit. You convince your colleagues uh, on a whole host of issues, like on the pension bill, where we save the pension of 100,000 Ohio workers, Ohio, Ohio, Ohio union workers. So um, that's how you do this job. You don't approach it arrogantly. And I know best. I don't care um, that women have said that they want control with their doctors of their own health care. I know better. And I'm going to do I'm going to override that, overturn that. And that's really why this election, you know, it's, it's always, as you know, Lawrence, we've talked in the show, you've said you've devoted your show to this in many ways. It's whom you fight for. And it's it's government needs to be on. It's, it's who's on your side. And that's really why I win in Ohio and why we're going to see a pretty good year this year around the country. Now, there were uh, indications that the Democratic Party, certainly, and not so sure about you, but the Democratic Party definitely wanted uh, Moreno as your opponent because they believe that the more extreme uh, the Republican is, the better it is for you. And it would have been more of a challenge for you running against the more moderate Republican. Uh, what, what's your assessment of what it's going to take uh, in running against Moreno? Yeah, I didn't I didn't weigh in on that. I I didn't even know that that was going to happen until it did happen. Um, but, it, you know, it goes back. I mean, I first of all, I'm going to have a tough race. They're going to have tens of millions of dollars. Marino is a rich guy uh, who inherited a lot of wealth and he's going to be spending it in this prime in this race as he did in the primary. But I always come down who's whose side of you. And that's why I ask people uh, to come to SheridBrown.com and help us as volunteers, as contributors. We'll win this race. We'll be outspent. But we'll be well out organized. We'll have more grassroots contributors. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's that's how I won elections in the past. I don't I don't see politics left or right. I see it as whose side you on. And that means taking on the drug companies uh, and, and putting a cap, as you've talked on this show, putting a cap on insulin at thirty five dollars and putting a cap on out of pocket costs for seniors. It means passing the PACT Act. It means passing the pension bill. It means uh, standing up for the child tax credit, which dropped temporarily only a year, but we'll be back with it, uh, drop the child poverty rate by 40 percent. I learned those things by listening to people. The mother-in-law of, a, of, a, of Heath Robinson, the bill's named after him in the PACT Act, listening to his mother-in-law talk about what happened to him when he returned from service after exposure to those burn pits. And that's how you legislate. And my opponent is, thinks you legislate by um, just doing what you think you should do. And I don't think people trust that. They don't trust him on abortion. They don't trust him on ethics. They don't trust him on fighting, on taking on interest groups.
The uh, Democratic Senate uh, Campaign Committee weighed in uh, against your Republican opponent tonight just about a minute uh, after the race was called uh, for Bernie Marino, who will now be the Republican nominee running against you for Senate. Uh, let's look at the ad they put out tonight. Meet Bernie Marino. Even Republicans don't trust him. This is why this man can't be trusted. I don't know if we can trust you. Bernie would overrule Ohio voters to pass a national abortion ban. Absolute, absolute pro-life, no exceptions. He said he doesn't think that the minimum wage should exist. And at the end of the day, the markets will flush that out. And he would repeal the Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act, it actually made health care much more expensive. The bill to secure the border and keep fentanyl out of our communities, he called it complete garbage, complete garbage. And he was sued by employees because he didn't pay them overtime they'd earned and destroyed evidence to get out of it. You shredded those documents because it helped Bernie Marino, not the employees. To put it simply, this is a matter of trust. Republicans don't trust Bernie Marino. Why should you? What else, what, what else would you like me to say? So this is the Donald Trump chosen candidate uh, to run in Ohio. Donald Trump uh, is, has been on a winning streak in Ohio himself. Uh, so it seems to me that, that this candidate's going to have an awful lot of support from Donald Trump, while you have support from the Democratic Senate Campaign Committee. Well, and I'm going to run my own race. I'm not a pundit about who's going to vote how. I know that uh, when I focus on taking on interest groups, when I focus on what we've done to fight back against what Norfolk Southern did to a lot of people in my state with that train derailment, what the drug companies have done uh, on overpricing, what, what my wife and I, every, almost every Sunday after church, we go to a grocery store in the neighborhood. And I, I see people all the time who are paying more for their groceries uh, because of stock buybacks and because of bonuses that executives get. So people know, regardless of who's running for president, regardless of, of any of those punditry comments, people know that I'm going to stand up and take on interest groups. That's why, you know, as I've done before, that's why I ask people to come to SharonBrown.com, step up. This will be a grassroots effort. Uh, we show that every day. It's how I win elections. It's how you represent people. You don't just go to country clubs and go to Wall Street and do all that. You you show up in communities, you do roundtables, you listen to people because the best ideas, I don't have the best ideas, the best ideas come from people in my state, big cities, small towns, suburbs, farms. I met with a number of farmers this past week, soybean farmers, and we talked about what we can do for with, with soybeans and, 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 and uh, may actually turning into jet fuel. And I wouldn't have thought of that, but these farmers did, and we've seen the science that that can happen. And, and there's just all kinds of opportunities opportunities. If you open your ears and listen, uh, you can make a big difference in this job. And I think that I don't think my opponent understands that. I do. That's why I've been successful every day working for Ohio and why I've been successful in elections in the past. Senator Sherrod Brown, thank you very much for teaching me something always. I did not know about our dear friend Martin Sheen. <laughs> and, thank you, Lawrence, uh, And always. for joining us tonight on this important <laughs> election night in Ohio. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator. And coming up, Donald Trump is finally admitting in his way that he is not a billionaire and cannot afford to post a bond of half a billion dollars during his appeal of the half billion dollar judgment against him for business fraud in New York State. And Donald Trump descended into public panic today, outright panic about his own personal financial crisis on the same day that the first of the Trump White House staff to go to prison reported to his new home address at a federal prison in Florida. That's next. It was a very rough day for Donald Trump's voters. Today, Donald Trump told his followers who believe he is the smartest person in the world and used to believe that he was the richest person in the world, that he is in tragic financial circumstances because of the $454 million civil judgment against him for business fraud in New York State, because in order to appeal that judgment, Donald Trump said, quote, I would be forced to mortgage or sell great assets, perhaps at fire sale prices, and if and when I win the appeal, they would be gone. Does that make sense? 
witch hunt election interference exclamation point. Trump voters now have to ask themselves, how can the smartest man in the world be so stupid to allow this to happen? But Trump voters will probably never ask themselves that question because they are the same people who have sent hundreds of millions of dollars in campaign contributions to Donald Trump over the years after he promised them that he would never ask for a campaign contribution from anyone because he is so rich. Without those campaign contributions, Donald Trump would not be able to afford his teams of criminal defense lawyers. And Trump voters should be asking themselves tonight, how did the smartest man in the world allow one of his White House staff, Peter Navarro, to go to prison today <clears throat> for refusing to comply with a subpoena? Why did the smartest man in the world hire someone stupid enough to do that? Peter Navarro gave an angry press conference of sorts outside of the Florida federal prison that became his new home address today. Peter Navarro said he was pissed. That, of course, was my, probably true, but it would have been more accurate to say that he is stupid. Everything else Peter Navarro said that you are not hearing right now was a lie, which is why you're not hearing it. Donald Trump was the guy who promised his supporters that he would hire the best people, the very best people in his administration. And no one has criticized the people who Donald Trump hired more than Donald Trump, who has attacked every one of those best people who are now saying Donald Trump is unfit to be president because they saw him up close when he was president. One measure of how good you are at hiring is how many of the people you hire go to prison? The correct answer is supposed to be zero. But in Donald Trump's business, his longtime chief financial officer has already served time and is now accused of other crimes. Michael Cohen, Donald Trump's lawyer, served time. And Peter Navarro is the first Trump administration official to go to prison with Steve Bannon on track to be the second once his appeal is exhausted for the same crime that Peter Navarro committed defying a subpoena. And in Georgia, Trump's last White House chief of staff, Mark Meadows, and Trump Justice Department official Jeffrey Clark could be on their way to prison at the end of that case, as could Donald Trump's legal team, including Rudolph Giuliani, who illegally tried to overturn the presidential election. Joining us now is Andrew Weissman, former FBI general counsel and former chief of the criminal division in the Eastern District of New York. He is the co-author of the new best-selling book, The Trump Indictments. And Tim O'Brien is with us, the senior executive editor of Bloomberg Opinion and author of Trump Nation. He is host of the Bloomberg podcast Crash Course and an MSNBC political analyst. Andrew, uh, what happens now? Donald Trump can go forward with his appeal, but his assets won't be protected without a bond, which means that the attorney general could presumably start closing in on some of those assets. Absolutely. So he's allowed to appeal, and that has nothing really to yeah, do with the bond. Yeah, just parenthetically, he's claiming to his followers, they won't let me appeal unless I put up the half a billion dollars yes. to appeal. That's a lie. Yes. You can appeal. Yes, that is a lie. Everyone can appeal. Exactly. This has to do with the judgment and whether it can be enforced. To be clear, the judgment is technically enforceable now, um, but the attorney general in New York has given, which is fairly common, a 30-day grace period uh, to him to basically either put up the, uh, the money or put up the bond. And so that 30 days ends on Monday. I should point out that Donald Trump's um, Truth Social post makes zero sense because he can get a mortgage on his real estate if it's not leveraged already. In other words, there's nothing, if he has $454 million in equity in any of his real estate assets, he can do what lots of people in this country do with much smaller uh, real estate, which is just get a mortgage and pay. There's nothing, and the, that property isn't sold. He can just get a mortgage and do that. Apparently, he does not have that ability because it, all of his assets, or at least there's not enough um, assets that are not leveraged. So what can the attorney general do? Starting on Monday, she can issue liens on any and all property, whether it's real estate, whether it's bank accounts, securities accounts, cash, cash equivalents, that freezes the account. Then she can do court actions to essentially transfer that 
to her. So all of the unencumbered assets can be transferred to the state of New York. Third, if she can't find everything, she can take depositions up to and including Donald Trump to find any and all assets and do the same thing. So on any money, by the way, that Donald Trump receives, she can attach that to satisfy the $454 million. So if he does not either get that amount lowered by the court or figure out a way to post a bond, that is what we're going to start to see happening on Monday. Uh, Tim O'Brien, under oath depositions of Donald Trump asking him about how much of this building do you actually own? Uh, you've done that research. Donald Trump sued you when you wrote uh, that he was not uh, as rich as he claimed to be. Uh, you, of course, won that lawsuit because Donald Trump was indeed lying about how rich he was. Uh, when, when, when the attorney general goes in here eventually to start looking at these assets, uh, is she going to find that, you know, th that this building actually has several mortgages on it already, and that's why you can't get an additional mortgage on it, <laughs> even though there might be $25 million in equity left in it, you can't get to it because there's too much encumbrance on all of these properties already. Right. The, 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 the term of art, Lawrence, in the financial world is leverage. And Donald Trump has always loved leveraging everything he owns to take on more debt so he can buy more things because he's wildly in, undisciplined financially and strategically. Uh, a year ago, he said in a deposition that he had $400 million in cash and he was adding significant amounts to that total every month because his business was so robust and the cash was just flowing through his coffers. Now, he's now saying he doesn't have that money at hand. Um, either for, and there's only three reasons that explain that. Um, either the cash isn't there and never was, he burned through it over the last year, or he simply doesn't want to put up his own money. There's no other, there's no other explanation for why that 400 million he claimed to have disappeared. And he's now in this, I don't think he could have ever anticipated when he was uh, trying to embarrass uh, Judge Goran and Letitia James and the entire judicial process against him, that he would wind up in a position where these financial dominoes are starting to tumble. Because on Monday, when, when Tish James decides to start to attach assets because Trump hasn't paid up, if, if something extraordinary doesn't happen between now and next Monday, which could be an outside party giving him money or someone deciding at the end to, to, to post a bond on his behalf, it, none of, neither of those situations look likely. Um, you're going to, for the first time, get a look at in, you know, behind the kimono at Trump's financial holdings. And he has never been public about the amount of, honest publicly, about the amount of debt he holds against those party, those properties. You're going to get a look at that. You're going to get a real sense of what the valuations are. And when Donald Trump began campaigning in 2016, uh, he put out in press statements that he was worth $8 billion and then $10 billion. At various <laughs> times, he said he was $6 billion. Uh, uh, more recently, you know, my colleagues at Bloomberg News have said he's worth about $3 billion. That is all on paper. And that number can start to decline very quickly if you don't have cash and you don't have other liquid assets and you've got a lot of debt pledged against it. It is the worst experience he wants to have in the world. And, and there's been this sort of guessing game around Trump's wealth, as you noted you know, he sued me for three pages of a very long book that that uh, essentially hung him up on this idea that he'd been playing the media and his bankers for decades about how much money he has. Now that becomes a public thing, a public event, and he has to be feeling right now, I think, like a cornered animal, and 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 it has to be his worst nightmare financially. Well, uh, Andrew, that cornered animal feel was absolutely there in his panic uh, social media comments today. There's a couple of things going on here, it seems. One is Donald Trump's complete inability to anticipate consequences until they are upon him. Uh, it, it was clear to us months and months and months ago that this was roughly the number where this case was going to end up. And yes, there's real civil liability there. Uh, but it, it, you get the feeling that Donald Trump's lawyers never impressed that upon him. He never really believed it could come to this. Uh, and now that it's come to this, the next stage could be Donald Trump under oath about his assets. And one of the options Tim just laid out 
about Donald Trump's claim under oath about having 400 million in cash. He didn't use this word. But one of the options was that was perjury. <laughs> yeah. you know, that was just a lie. Yeah. So here we go again, Donald. You're under oath. How much of this building do you own? But at that point, they'll also be subpoenaing documentation that shows the building is mortgaged seven different ways. Right? Yeah. So I, I, this is going to be a situation where the emperor has no clothes is going to be something mm -hmm. where we, we see it. But to sort of Donald Trump's, the way he sort of approaches the world, I think, is exactly as you said. He is not a chess player. He is not thinking down the road, how do I get from here to there several stages down? Um, that is the skill set that you actually would like to have with the president of the United mm -hmm. States or the CEO of a major company. Um, he is very much focused on just the here and now and thinking everyone is like a giant etch-a-sketch and they're not going to remember what happens from day to day. So if I lie today, that's fine because I'm just going to move on to the next thing tomorrow. And, and Tim, what about this anticipation of consequences? Uh, th this is what Donald Trump fails at miserably. He failed at it in the casino business. He failed at it in pretty much every business you examined when you were first writing about him. He just couldn't anticipate consequences before they landed on him in a bad way. Because he's been protected from the consequences of his own actions his entire life. His father's wealth insulated him from his business mistakes and his poor academic performance. He was insulated by the power of celebrity uh, through the fame he garnered uh, when he was on The Apprentice. And then, of course, as president of the United States, he's been insulated from the consequences of the law thus far uh, in a way m most Americans aren't. So he's never had to grow up. Donald Trump is essentially a seven-year-old grown old. And, and, and that's exactly why he can't play three-dimensional chess or simply play checkers. He, he plays hopscotch and he constantly falls off the course because he is unsophisticated and, and he is self-absorbed and he doesn't see consequences when they're rushing at him because he thinks he can get around him. And I think one of the things we're seeing now in this litigation is this myth that Donald Trump has always been able to evade the long arm of the law. And, and I think that's been this sort of mythic thing, people wondering why he has nine legal lives. Um, and it's simply because he's never had a formidable array of, of prosecutors who are determined to try to expose him before. And, and some of that could still run aground, and we're seeing some of that in motion right now. But at least in this case, he's being held to account financially in a way he never has before. And, and, and it is a, a ruthless and I think long overdue come up in this. Tim O'Brien, thank you very much for joining us with your expertise about the Trump businesses. Andrew Weissman's going to stick with us. And up next, Donald Trump's lawyers filed a brief with the Supreme Court today claiming that a president cannot function without committing crimes and that it was just an oversight by the authors of the Constitution that they did not specify in writing total immunity for presidents and former presidents from criminal prosecution. Trump lawyers ignored the fact that no president before or after Donald Trump has ever believed any of that. That's next. Today, Donald Trump's criminal defense lawyers filed an appeals brief with the United States Supreme Court, asking the Supreme Court to establish a new constitutional principle that is not even hinted at in the Constitution and which no president before Donald Trump thought was constitutional or asked the Supreme Court to make it constitutional. Donald Trump is asking the Supreme Court for full criminal immunity for everything Donald Trump did while he was president of the United States and after he was president of the United States. The Trump brief begins with this lie. A denial of criminal immunity would incapacitate every future president with de facto blackmail and extortion while in office and condemn him to years of post-office trauma at the hands of political opponents. The Trump brief does not explain why that has never happened in the entire 235-year history of the American presidency when no one in the presidency or in the American criminal justice system ever believed that a former president could not be prosecuted for crimes. 
everyone in the criminal justice system and in the country believed that Richard Nixon could be prosecuted for crimes that he committed while he was president. And President Gerald Ford, who took office after Nixon resigned, was absolutely certain that the Justice Department would definitely prosecute Richard Nixon for crimes committed while Nixon was president, which is why President Ford pardoned Richard Nixon in 1974. In the eight presidents from Nixon to Trump, every one of them was always 100% certain that they could be prosecuted for crimes committed in office just as Richard Nixon was going to be prosecuted before he was pardoned. Not one of those presidents was inhibited in any way in office in doing their duty by fear of being prosecuted. The history of the American presidency and the American criminal justice system, especially the post-Nixon history, proves beyond a reasonable doubt that this statement in the Trump brief is a lie. The threat of future prosecution and imprisonment would become a political cudgel to influence the most sensitive and controversial presidential decisions, taking away the strength, authority, and decisiveness of the presidency. In an earlier brief to the Supreme Court, arguing that there was no reason for the court to hear Donald Trump's appeal, Special Prosecutor Jack Smith said that the criminal immunity that Donald Trump is asking the Supreme Court to write into constitutional law, quote, would upend understandings about presidential accountability that have prevailed throughout history while undermining democracy and the rule of law, particularly where, as here, a former president is alleged to have committed crimes to remain in office despite losing an election, thereby seeking to subvert constitutional procedures for transferring power and to disenfranchise millions of voters. Andrew Weissman is back with us. Uh, and Andrew, it's, you know, it's a reasonably sized uh, brief to a Supreme Court appeal. Got 50 pages in here. Uh, did you find anything that is worthy of Supreme Court consideration in this argument? No. Um, but to, to add to your litany of presidents post-Nixon, it's worth noting that you can add Donald Trump himself, because during the second impeachment, his argument as to why he should not be impeached, successfully convicted in, in the Senate, was because he could always be criminally prosecuted later, um, that there should not be this rush to decide things now. He's about to leave office, but there is always the criminal justice system. So you can add him to that litany. Um, there are two things that I thought were quite interesting in this brief. One, I think you will really like, because I was sitting here with you when you were pointing out that Brett Kavanaugh, before he was on the Supreme Court, wrote an article where he said that current presidents should have enjoy mm -hmm. criminal immunity, that, that you have to wait until they're out of office and former presidents can be prosecuted. So you might be thinking, well, that doesn't help. Donald Trump in this position because he's being prosecuted as a former president. That Brett Kavanaugh article is cited in this brief, and it is incorrectly cited for the proposition that former presidents cannot be charged. This is a point that my colleague at NYU, Ryan Goodman, pointed out when he looked at this and sort of fell off his chair and was like, there is, that is such a huge stumble. If you're going to cite a sitting justice, you might want to get that right. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, you, you can spend a lifetime reading these and never find a Supreme Court justice quoted, cited incorrectly uh, in a brief submitted to the, the Supreme Court. I mean, th this is a level of incompetence that that, that I've never seen before and that, of course, Donald Trump is incapable of even realizing. Second point in the brief to add to your litany of things that are incorrect, whether intentional or not, is the statement that all of Donald Trump's actions with respect to January 6th and leading up to it was because he, the then president, was aware of, and I'm just going to paraphrase, this substantial amount of evidence that there was fraud in the election. 
the site to that is to members of Congress um, and to his sitting vice president. Um, so neither of those are citations to actual facts. Um, and there'll, there'll be a reason for that, which is that 60 judges who heard this said there was no fraud and that would change the outcome of the election. It's remarkable in the introduction of a brief in the Supreme Court to have that statement sort of sitting there that he somehow has this undisclosed evidence, which he still is representing to the Supreme Court of the United States, but has never, ever represented to the American public. We, uh, so the next uh, filing on this will be Jack Smith's reply to this. Uh, and the Smith filings are the exact opposite uh, in this, just uh, flawless all the way through. Uh, we'll be waiting to see uh, what he has to say about this. Andrew Weissman, thank you very much for Welcome. joining us tonight. And up next, President Biden is campaigning in the Southwest this week and making direct appeals to Latino voters in campaign ads using the Biden-Harris campaign's huge fundraising advantage over the Trump campaign to pay for early advertising. Simon Rosenberg will join us next. Today, President Joe Biden kicked off a three-day campaign swing through Nevada, Arizona, and Texas with an interview on Univision Radio, which offers programming for Spanish-speaking audiences. But here's the thing I want to stop. Yes. Trump this Saturday called migrants. He said they're not people. He said immigrants are poisoning the blood of this country. He separated children from parents at the border, caged the kids, plans mass deportations of the tens of thousands of people here. He wants to end birthright citizenship. I mean, we have to stop this guy. We can't let this happen. We are a nation of immigrants. The Biden-Harris campaign released this new ad as part of their $30 million ad campaign in battleground states with the reminder for Spanish speakers about what Joe Biden has done for grandparents who need insulin. For our abuelos. Insulin that costs $35. Or hundreds. That is the difference between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. For women the freedom to control our own bodies or doctors going to jail for an abortion. This is the difference between Joe Biden or Donald Trump. Only one choice is right. And the difference between them is your vote. I'm Joe Biden, and I approve this message. Joining our discussion now is Simon Rosenberg, Democratic strategist and author of Hopium Chronicles on Substack. Uh, Simon, president uh, working in the Southwest, uh, trying to shore up the Latino vote. Uh, once again tonight in Ohio, uh, President Biden getting a much higher percentage of the vote in his primary than Donald Trump does in his primary. Uh, Sherrod Brown now has an identified opponent in the Senate election race, a full Trump-supported opponent who is uh, as Trumpy as Donald Trump. Uh, what's your assessment of the state of the race on this Ohio primary night? Well, I think that the most important thing, as you mentioned, is that the Biden campaign is really turning on. I mean, we're start they're starting to spend the money that you mentioned, this big cash advantage they have over Trump. They're starting to get deeper now into the general election. The, the president and the vice president are campaigning much more. And there's some evidence. I mean, I don't want to jump the gun here a little bit, but there's some evidence that you're starting to see things shift a little bit more in his favor. There are five polls taken since the State of the Union and have Biden ahead now. Uh, and in the Economist tracking poll, uh, the, the Economist averages, it tracks all the polls. He's actually up by one point over Trump now. So, you know, here we are. We're in the general election. Joe Biden's a strong president. The Democratic Party's winning elections across the country. And Trump is an unprecedented dumpster fire, as you've been talking about all night on this show. So uh, we're, we're running the ads that the Biden campaign is doing because yeah. they can afford them and the Trump campaign cannot. <laughs> uh, some stunning numbers coming out about Trump fundraising. Uh, in 2023, last year, the year before the election year, the Trump yeah. campaign raised 62.5 percent less money from the small uh, dollar donors than it did in 2019, the year before that election. And those small dollar donors are really huge funders uh, in the aggregate of past Trump yep. campaigns. 
Yeah, look, I mean, Trump is in trouble right now. I think the the you know the Trump is strong bubble is bursting in front of our eyes. I mean, he's been under as we've discussed on air here. He's been underperforming polling in virtually every early state and struggling in these primaries much more than Biden did in in his. They're you know they're struggling mightily raising money, both hard dollars. Uh, with low dollar donors and also high dollar donors, right? We're going to see one of the worst uh, presidential year financial reports from Trump probably in the next few days. Republicans are fleeing the House and retiring in, in record numbers. There's an unprecedented revolt in the Republican Party right now. We've got news today that a bunch of Haley's most important fundraisers, wealthy people, have now shifted over to Biden and not to Trump. I mean, this thing, Lawrence, we've been doing this a long time. I mean, this is the ugliest political thing that we've ever seen. And I think part of what's beginning to happen now is the bubble, this idea that Trump is somehow strong. He's not. He's weak. He's a dumpster fire. He's not a juggernaut. And, and I think that the media is beginning to wake up to the fact that Biden is coming out of the State of the Union strong with a huge wind at his back. And Trump is struggling in an unprecedented way as we head into the general. Uh, the New York Times is reporting that there's more money coming Biden's way. The League of Conservation Voters want yeah. to put $120 million uh, into the Biden campaign. Outside groups like that uh, seem, are pledged already for at least a billion dollars. No such announcements on the Republican side. Yeah, look, there is, as we've discussed, I mean, since Dobbs, the Democratic Party is fired up and we've been winning elections, raising tons of money. We've been taking stuff away from them all over the country. It's a very energized party. We know what's at stake here, right? We know that democracy is on the line. And, you know, people all across the country are responding to this call to step up for the Democrats. The same has not been happening on the Republican side. I mean, since Dobbs, they have struggled again and again in election after election. They're now struggling to raise money as well. And, and I think that, you know, we head into the general here with the Democratic Party strong, unified and winning elections, the Republican Party struggling, deeply divided and in, in rough shape as we head into the general. So, you know, as I like to say, Lawrence, in every way imaginable, I would much rather be us than them as we head into the general election now. Yeah, and the reason we stress the money is that the big money expenditure is buying television ads, and that is still the way that you reach the swing voter in the end. Simon Rosenberg, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thanks, Lawrence. We'll be right back. That is tonight's last word.